الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد the cover the subject we're trying to cover which is the fiqh of Ramadan is a huge subject those of brothers that are from San Diego you know we covered it over months when we did Akhtar al-Mukhtasarat and in Za'ad it will take us probably longer when we're doing Zad al-Mustakni and Umda we took a long time here I'm trying to finish in one day so yesterday we talked about the Fadail and virtues and the Maghfirah of Ramadan today I'm going to very briefly discuss the rulings I will not be able to fulfill the haqq of this bab, even if you gave me a month, because there's a lot of depth to it, khilaf and adilla. But I'm gonna go through it in a summarized way. Before I do, I just wanna give you advice that if you really wanna study more, uh, we have, for example, at the Majd Ribad channel, we have playlists, where has more adilla evidences and khilaf, you can go check that. And better than that, you have an imman ulema here, like Sheikh Abu Abdullah, um, you can learn from him and ask him questions and get the depth of the knowledge from him. I am like uh, just a little cliff notes for the for you brothers, inshallah. So yesterday we talked about song and what is the meaning of fasting in the linguistic sense. What was it? To to control yourself. No, abstain from eating and drinking is not the linguistic meaning of it. The lugha. When we uh, it's to, subdue. Mm -hmm. to subdue your desires. To refrain from something. Like we gave the adilla from the Quran about the statement of Maryam alayhi salam. This was from Kalam and she was Soma, right? But Shara'an in the Sharia, what does it mean? Al Imsad, the niyati, and Shia Mahsusa. Fi Zaman Muayyin. Min shafs mahsus. If you should, if you know Arabic, write it down in Arabic. If you don't, I will translate, inshallah. Shar'an in the Sharia, ah, it means to refrain yourself with awwalan intention. <coughs> now, let's say, like for example, I usually go to work early and I sometimes uh, skip food until I come home. And it's already past Maghrib by the time I get home. Does that mean I fasted? La. First thing, a niyyah. For the obligatory fasting, the fard fasting, like Ramadan, it's fard. That's mustahab. When you make another, uh, when you make an oath that becomes obligatory, for that you need the niyyah before the fasting begins, before fajr, قبل الفجر. Doesn't mean you have to read some kind of script like, oh, I'm going to fast tomorrow for the sake of Allah, Ramadan, 20th of Ramadan. No. But you have to have a niyyah. Where is the place for the niyyah? The heart. So when you plan your suhoor, you plan your thought, this is your niyyah. So you have to have that before fajr. Make your niyyah, I'm gonna fast tomorrow. This obligatory. For the non-obligatory fasting, for the nafal fast, for example, Mondays and Thursdays, for example, the middle days of the month, for example, uh, the 10 days in Muharram, for Arafah. Here, if it's not a fard fast, you can begin the niyyah after fajr as long as you have not eaten okay? and i'm, I'm going to get into some proofs but not a lot if you want the depth of the evidences watch the more detailed videos right rasulullah sometimes would wake up he would ask aisha is there anything to eat she would say no he said khalas i'm gonna fast and it's bad al fajr but that's a nafal fasting and that's a dalil that for nafal fasting the niyyah can be by the way you still have to have niyyah you cannot go until past Maghrib and say, okay, I'm going to start fasting in the past. <laughs> but for the fourth fasting, you need to do it قبل الفجر. It's an intention. And to stay away from particular things. Those things that are ordained by Allah and His Messenger. This is not linked. You cannot just pick, you know what, I'm going to fast from sugar. You cannot eat sugar if you want, but that's not a song, Sharia. Sharia and the fasting is to stay away from the things that have been ordained. What are they? We will talk about it, inshallah. And it has to be at a particular time, right? Because in the Sharia fasting, 
There are rulings when you can, and when you cannot, and when you must, and when you must not fast. For example, if you just want to fast on Jum'ah, just by itself, can you fast Jum'ah? No, Rasul Sallam forbid it. This is not a day that's mu'in for fasting. Tell you, what if you're making up a fast, then you could, right? Now, what about just Saturday, just Sunday? No. But if you add a day to it, so you don't go to Shbihan to the Sabbath and so on, then you could. Right? What about the day of Eid? Can you fast? No. La. no. What if you're making up a fast? Can you fast on Eid? No. La. Here you cannot, even if you're making up a fast. Eid? So everything has its rulings and evidences, right? So it has a particular <coughs> Ramadan. Fasting in Ramadan is obligatory. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shahar Ramadan in the Quran. <coughs> what if I want to fast? The month of Ramadan in December. Shorter days. The nation of Kufr, they used to do this. <laughs> they would fast nation all their Islam. fasting. What? Nation of Islam, they do that with the No, no, nation of Kufr. <laughs> yeah, nation of Kufr, yeah. <laughs> Tell you, we are inshallah the nation of Islam. Ummah. <laughs> Tell you. So, fasting has to be when Allah ordained. Can I fix Ramadan to, to say that it has to be every uh, July of this? No. That's what the Mushrikeen used to do. They used to add days to the year so that they could fix Ramadan. No, Allah made it that Ramadan will sometimes be in the summer and sometimes in the winter, sometimes long days, sometimes short. So you can benefit from all different types of fasting. So it has to be at a particular time. And from particular people, tell you, what if you have a three-year-old daughter or two-year-old daughter or a baby, you're going to make them fast? That's not the Sharia. Allah does not burden them with that. But let's say you're 30 and you're healthy and everything is good and you're like, I don't feel like it. That, and then you have to fast. Right? So it has to be from particular people. Yajib was so. The fasting is obligatory. Ramadan. In Ramadan, in the month of Ramadan, the Ru'yat al Hilal. So the first thing that obligates fasting in the month of Ramadan is what? Citing the moon. Tayyab, did it say Al-Hisab? I need to calculate. No. Did it say that just so you know the moon is out there? No. No. To see the moon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ The one that witnesses a shahr, the end of Ramadan, then you should fast. فَلِيَسُومُهُ He does not say when Ali, whoever knows, shahid. What does it mean to see? We'll discuss the adilla. The moon, contrary to what you may uh, think, never goes anywhere, by the way. It's always there. How do we get a crescent? There's nobody that eats the moon and it grows back or something. It is the reflection of the light from the sun that hits the moon and the amount of visibility on the earth tells us which lunar day is it. Okay? So people that say we calculated that the moon is going to be the birth of the new moon and so on, cannot because it's not that the moon went somewhere. This is not, uh, يعني, well, okay, we can show that the moon is still there. But it is the seeing of the hilal. Tell you, the seeing of the hilal is going to have some differences. That's why people who bring the method of calculation to begin the month or end the month of Ramadan are doing something that Shaykh Anna Salih al Fawzan said is a bid'ah. Not me, Shaykh Salih. You can look it up. Okay? If we look at the madahib, we have two opinions, and we'll discuss them, about the sighting, whether it's اختلاف المتعالي أو الوحظ المتعالي, we'll talk about that. But no madhab took the opinion from the madhahib al arba that you can calculate out the moon for Ramadan. This is something, an innovation. As Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah discussed it, it's not that this wasn't something Muslims couldn't do. They had very advanced mathematical models. They could predict Salah timings even to our time and so on. They, they had the ability, but they did not do that because that is not the Shari'i method. We had uh, some people bring this 
concept to Saudia. And in Saudi Arabia, the government told them, this was in the Arab newspapers and stuff. They came from the United Kingdom and stuff. They said, we'll show you a mathematical model so you don't have to worry about signing. They said, these Bedouins over here, they've been signing it for years. They said, we guarantee you they cannot see it. The mathematical model says it cannot be seen. They said, okay, go out with that. The government sent them out. They set up their telescopes, everything. They said, there's no way it can be seen. And they saw it. And the Bedouins who had generations of experience, they knew. And they were shocked. And that's why the calculation models that they have, they have differences. This is not an exact science. This is not like, okay, you, you add this chemical to this chemical and this reaction. It's not like that. That's what they want to sell it as. But go to moonsighting.com, for example, and look at their model. And then go to crescentwatch.com and look at their model. And you'll see differences. Because they cannot, they're not predicting whether the moon is there or not. The moon's there. They're predicting our ability to see the reflection or not. And that's why it's not a scientific fact that we're talking about. We're talking about predictions. And we don't go by predictions. We go by Rukhul Tihila. Very simple. Amongst the ulema of Islam, there are two major opinions and then one hybrid that I will talk about regarding the sighting of the moon. The one is that if the moon has been sighted, then it is an obligation on the whole ummah. <coughs> and if the moon is sighted anywhere in the world, this is the wahdatul muta'aliya, which is one matla, one shared horizon, which is that if it's sighted anywhere in the world, it is binding on the whole world. Tayyib. And this is the well known opinion of the two famous uh, Imams from amongst the famous four, which is Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmad al Hamad. This is the well known opinion from their madahir. Imam al Shafi'i. His opinion, and some of the earlier, uh, we'll talk about the ulema as well. They said, no, the, each area has their own side. Today we call that local side, so global and local. These are both valid opinions amongst the ulema of Islam. Calculations is not, it's a bid'ah. Right? But these two are valid opinions. But what are the evidences? Those ulama like Abu Hanifa, even though most of the Hanafis today, they take the local. But this is not their madhab. I mean, this is funny that they push it out, but you can look in their books. You can look in Al Hidayah, Al Quduri, or the Shuru of Al Hidayah, and so on. The well known opinion of Abu Hanifa and his madhab is that it is global. And this is the well known opinion of Ahmad, and the Maliki have some khilaf and so on. The Shafi'i madhab, the well known opinion from them is that it is a local site. The evidence for those who say that one sighting is enough is the general ahadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Man min fardan. not individual from you when you see the sighting of the Jara of Ramadan khalas, so you fast okay it's general it's a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that whoever sights the moon should fast so this is general for the ummah this is not individuals. So this is the evidence that they put forward. Tayyip. What about the Shafi'i Madhab? What is the evidences they put together? They put forward a famous hadith that uh, and is reported by Imam Ahmad and Imam Muslim and Al-Tirmidhi and others, where uh, Umm Al-Fadl uh, bin Harith, she mentions about an incident that happened with the people, and I'm gonna summarize, when the people in Sham, they saw the moon. And later on in the month, when they went to Medina, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu asked him about it. He said, when did you see it? He said, on Jum'ah, night of Jum'ah. He said, then we didn't see it until the night of Sabt, of Saturday. So we will finish our day. So between Damishq and Medina, they take this to be where you should have local sighting because Abdullah ibn Abbas did not take that sighting from Damishq. Tayyip. There are two issues with this. Okay. The first issue is this is not marfu'an. This is not from the Prophet ﷺ. This is mawqufan. This is from the Sahabi. This is after the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So 
So to take it as an evidence above those adilla that are clearly from the Prophet is the first issue. But let's leave that issue. Let's say that this was uh, yani, uh, the Ummah was developed and so on at the time. Khalas. The other issue is what does it mean local then? Those people who mention local siding in the United States today take the matla, take our local to be from the top of Canada all the way down at minimum to Mexico. Some put Chile and northern, the northern part of South America into it. Some put Hawaii and not. Some put Cuba or not. But let's just take uh, North America. Canada, United States, Mexico. This is local. And what is the evidence they bring? Is the siding from Damish was not accepted in? Where? Medina. Medina. Come on, you guys sleeping already? <laughs> if you were in San Diego, the longer the what are you going to do? Tell you. So if you say the Dalil is the distance between the Mishk and Medina is too long, but your matla now is from northern Canada all the way down to Mexico, <laughs> it doesn't work. Then, as uh, one of the Imams in the Masjid said, we go city by city. City by city, there are cities that nobody even goes to look for the moon. What are you going to do then? So this evidence does not fit what is being done. So now we go back to the first opinion, which is that global side. If it's cited anywhere in the world, it is binding on the whole world. Okay, halas. Good opinion. We're good at it. But the problem now is let's talk about implementation. Anybody have your phone with you? What time is it in uh, Fiji right now? 12.01 p.m. 12.01 p.m. What day? Sunday. Sunday. Right? Yeah, Sunday. Yeah. So, now, here in America, in Utah, it is, what time is it? 6, 6, 6 02 p.m. This, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set the cycle of the moon, its cycle begins from the west. Unlike the sun. The sun rises from where? East. It doesn't physically rise, but I think the sighting of the sun starts from the east. And then it sets in the west. Come on, from California. Yeah? The sun sets where? West. Right? But the moon, its cycle begins and is strongest in the west. You can go look at how it is. Right? So that means you have a greater chance of sighting it in the west than the east. And if it is sighted somewhere, then no doubt it had to have been visible west of it, but not east of it. So now, if we sight the moon, for example in Ramadan, here in Utah, let alone California or Hawaii, and you tell the people in China, this is binding on you, or in Fiji, they've already had breakfast and lunch. So this is why, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, and one of the opinions amongst the Hanabina, which is the opinion that I take after a lot of research, like I spent years on this issue, is that wherever the moon is sighted, it is binding to the west of it, but not to the east of it. Why? Because it is very possible from the way that the moon cycle is, that it would be sighted in the west and could never have been sighted in the east of it. But it is impossible from the way that Allah has said, and the Taymiyyah discussed, it's not something new. That if it is sighted, it had to have been visible to the west, whether people saw it or not. So now look at a practical implementation. Let's say you sighted in Utah. Can the people in California that are west of you fast? Yes. We're behind you in time. Can the people in Hawaii fast? Yes. If China or Fiji sights it, can we all fast? Yes. The opposite cannot. See? So after a lot of research, and I'm summarizing from, I could write a book on this issue, I spent so much time on it. The correct opinion is that if it's cited, let's say if Kuwait or Saudi or Pakistan or whatever cited, it is binding on us. Because we are Western. But it is not binding on China and Japan, because they are Eastern. Okay? Now, again, like I said, we could go detail into this, but I will not because of the sake of time. Now, if it is cloudy, if it's cloudy, 
on the the 29th of Sha'ban. Will Sha'ban be 30 or not? Here, what is correct is that you do not fast. Kurin. It's makruh to fast on that day. Rather, that day it becomes known as Yom Shak and you do not fast it. Now, if it's not cloudy, but there's other issues of visibility, I'm not going to go deeper into that. You can watch the Asad Durus for that. But this is correct. Then what do you do in that situation? You complete 30 days of Shaban. 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 So, so, now, if somebody calculates, they use calculations, and it's on the 29th and it's cloudy, what do they do? They fast. I mean, they, they disobey the Prophet Because the Prophet told them it's cloudy, what do you do? You finish the 30 days of Shaban. Yeah? That's why we don't go by calculations. Here, Alhamdulillah, you have a Shaykh, you have a unit, you have a masjid. The Shaykh is your opinion. Right? Just giving you general guidelines. Tayyib. Now, when we talk about the obligation of fasting once it has been established, either by sighting the moon on the 29th, I mean the night of the, uh, before the 30th, or by finishing 30 days of Sha'ban. If it's cloudy, you finish 30 days, you don't look for the moon anymore. Khalas. If it's 30 days, khalas. Sha'ban is not going to be 31 days. Then, you fast for Ramadan, the day. So either one of the two methods. Who must fast? So it becomes wujuban. Yani be, be on those people that are yani of the age, those people that are, say, awwalan Muslim. Who must fast? Every Muslim. We do not obligate fasting on non Muslims. And even if Ahlul Dhimma live amongst the Muslims, you cannot tell them, you must fast from Allah. Right? And who is mukallaf? Who is obligated? It is compulsory on them. Right? Like we mentioned little children and things, people, that it is not, they're not at the bulugh yet, not on them. And qadir, able, capable of fasting. Because you could have a situation, somebody is sick, somebody is elderly, somebody has health issues, somebody is traveling, somebody is in a situation that they cannot fast. If, they are, if there's a shari'i reason and they are not qadir, they are not able, capable, then we do not obligate fasting on them. Tayyib, and whose witness can we accept for citing the moon? If if some drunk uh, person comes who's kafir and tells you, I saw the moon, can you accept it? La. Faqal al-Mu'allif. The Mu'allif says here, bi ru'yati, with, with the signing of adlin. Somebody who is, as adl, who is of good moral character. And neither Muslim, they are well known. Now, they don't have to be ulama. They don't have to be people famous for zuhud and things. But somebody who has good moral character. If you get a drug, if you get a drug addict, if you get somebody who's known as a liar in the community, even if they're Muslim, their witness is not taken. Tayyip, if a Muslim comes and you see them in the masjid, mashallah, and they, you know nothing but good from them, do you have to now run an investigation and find their search history and things? No. Hasnadan, we expect good of our Muslim brothers and sisters. Right? Al there's nothing dhahir, there's nothing apparent that shows them to be fusaq, to be sinful. Tayyib. Makallaf. We're not going to take the sighting of a two-year-old. <laughs> Little kid's like, I saw the moon. Yeah, I think that was a lollipop. <laughs> right? So you have to be somebody who's makallaf. They are able. Law kana abdu. Even if they're enslaved. Even if it was a slave. Let's say, I mean, the time when America had slavery. I mean, there was a time in the U.S. there were slaves. There was no Muslim. If they sighted the moon, would there issue? No. In Islam, alhamdulillah, that sighting would be acceptable. Untha, what if a woman sights it? Her sighting is accepted. Do you have to have two witnesses in place of one man for women? Not in this issue. 
Some people bring this issue against in da'wah, like, oh, why two witnesses? Not in everything. In hadith, we have rawat from women, we take their as one woman, alhamdulillah. In this issue, one woman, two witnesses is enough. In some issues where there are emotions and criminal cases and things, business transactions, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows better, there you need a second witness. But here you do not. One woman would be enough of a witness. And what about somebody, somebody who's unable to articulate with words, I mean, they're, they're mute, but they can convey that they saw the moon, it's acceptable. But, la yakfi majhulul hal. But you cannot accept it from somebody who is in an unknown state. What does it mean, unknown state? So, somebody, we don't know anything about them. We've never seen them in the masjid. We don't know them to be good, yani practicing Muslim. We don't know anything about them. They're majhul. Just suddenly out of nowhere, somebody's like, I saw the moon. He's like, well, who are you? <laughs> Here you can ask them, are you Muslim? Well, where do you pray? Where do you pray Jum'ah? You can ask those questions. Because you cannot take somebody who's majhul al-hal. And this is mustala al-hadith in al-murjal. You know what majhul al-hal, majhul al-ayn and all of that is. But just generally, this is the thing. But if somebody is known, like they come to the masjid, they, they're Muslim, you see them in Jum'ah, and, and you see them on the parent practicing and khalas we accept they don't have to be for a particular nationality or a particular jama'ah or something like that no so now we know upon who is fasting obligated and we know that who would be enough of a witness to obligate the month of Ramadan to begin what is the dalil the dalil that one person is obligatory is enough is that Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he said that Sahaba, everybody was out looking for the moon and I saw it and nobody else saw it. And the Prophet sallallahu asked me if I was sure, yes. He, then he ordered the people to fast. So this is one person. Some people say, no, you have to have a large number. And then you ask them, what's a large number? And they say, whatever we want, basically. They just say large number. What does it mean? 10, 20, 12, 17? No, just a large number. And then if you have 12 people and they don't want it to be Ramadan, suddenly 12 is not a large number. And if they have their own jama'ah and they six people see it, then that's a large number. Right? This is just ambiguous. Yeah? But this is wrong. Because the clear, sahih, sarih, dalil from the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr, ibn Amr radiallahu anhu. But to end the month of Ramadan, you need two witnesses. To begin, how many do you need? One. To end, you need two. And there is a hadith clear from the Abbas about the Bedouins and so on, so on, which shows that a second witness was needed to end the month of Ramadan. So to begin, you need one. And to end, you need two. Because we have sari, clear, adillah, evidences. Tayyib. Who does not have to fast? And what would they do? To compensate for it. And again, I'm summarizing a lot. Man um, whoever is unable to fast because of kibr, not kibr like mutakabir, because of being kabir sin, because of being old. Kibar. Here, or mar, or a sickness that they do not expect that they will get better from. Shifa is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? We're just talking about gender. What does that mean? If somebody is uh, 80 years of age, and they have health issues, they are just older, and they are physically unable to fast, we do not force them to fast. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never puts a burden more than they can bear. And as far as I know, you don't get younger. You don't expect that next year they're going to be 79. Right? So here, we don't tell them you have to make it up. Tell you, what if somebody has a uh, very advanced type 1 diabetes? Right? It's genetic. It's, it's really I need something that doesn't seem like it's going to get any better, even if you go on diet or whatever. And they're unable to fast because of it. They come under the same room. Tell you. So, those people that have a sickness that they don't expect they'll get better from. And 
And again, everything is hands of Allah, but this is the expectation, right? Or somebody who's of who's unable to fast due to old age, what do they have to do? For every day they miss, they feed one poor person. So you don't tell them, okay, you're 80 and you didn't fast this Ramadan, next year you gotta make it up. Next year they're gonna be older than that. So what do they do instead? They feed one poor person per day. And if somebody has, may Allah protect us, somebody has advanced stage cancer, which doesn't look like it's going to recede, and they're unable to fast because of it, then we tell them, you, fa- you feed a needy person. All the ahkam, who can you feed one person on, and, and for the, all 30 days and one shot? I'm not going to get into all of that just because of time. We have the rules, you can look at them, inshallah, for all of those, or better yet, you can ask the shoe here. Tell you, what if somebody is sick, and inshallah, they're expecting to get better. What if you had a cold or not just a mild cold, but let's say may Allah protect us all, somebody had COVID in Ramadan, right? Or somebody was traveling, you were moving from place to place, your flights and things were so long, you would have 28 hour fast and so on. In that case, then no problem to that, they will not be obligated to fast, but they cannot feed a, a miskin for it. They have to make those days up. What if a woman has Eid or Nifas during Ramadan? She has to make those days up. Tayyib. Now, if you are traveling, if you're sick, should you fast or not? It's very easy, right? If the sickness is light, like let's say you just have a runny nose, well, let's go ahead and fast, all right. But if the sickness is severe, you have to take medicine in the daytime and so on, then don't fast. Easy. If it's going to cause you harm to fast, if you're diabetic and your doctor tells you, look, you can't fast, you're going to lose your eyesight, whatever, and then you fast, haram. You cannot kill yourself. You cannot harm yourself. This body is not yours. It's an amana from Allah. So, this is one thing. The other is, if you're traveling, is it permissible for the one that can make qasr, the one who's traveling a shari distance where they can shorten their salah, is it permissible for them not to fast? Yes, no doubt. We have ayat from Quran, adilla. But is it better for them to fast or not to fast? There is ikhtilaf of ulama. The madhab of the three uh, imma, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, and Imam Shafi'i, is that it is better for them to fast if they're able to when they're traveling. And they give the dalil that Rasulullah fasted while he was traveling. The madhab of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal is that it is better for them not to fast. And he gives the dalil. First and foremost, that this uh, rukhsa from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and uh, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has followed, this is a sadaqah, yani that when Allah gives you a uh, rukhsa, so it's upon you to accept it. Then they say that hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that mentioned Manis ibn Malik, that we were traveling with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and, and we were fasting, and Rasulullah he ordered them to break the fast, and he said, do you think this is piety? Do you think you're doing something good? Break the fast. So Imam Ahmad says the Amr of Nabi Ali Sallallahu takes precedence over, over the Amr. The Qawl takes precedence. Why? Because Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi used to be able to handle hardships that other could. He would fast into the night. He would fast without break. He would yani, push himself where Allah gave him the ability to. But when he tells the Ummah that don't fast every day, fast a day and not, not fast, then that is upon us. So when he gave the order to them, then this shows that the preference there is to not fast while traveling. But the fact that he did it shows that there is jawaz. It is permissible. So if you can handle it and there is no hardship and you do want to fast while traveling, you could. But better if your traveling is not to fast and to make it up. This is the Qawla Raja. This is the correct opinion. Allah. Tayyip. What about a woman who is pregnant or breastfeeding 
she is allowed, from what is correct, not to fast, if there is either a danger to, the, to her health or the child's health. And how would you make that up? Yani, when the danger is to the child and the wali had to give the scheme and when, if it's just to herself and she just makes it up. Again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go deep into that. But what I will say is that if you are pregnant and you're able to fast, there is no harm to your health. You're able, maybe you're in the first trimester and Alhamdulillah, you're okay. Khalas, go ahead and fast. But if you're pregnant, maybe it's your last trimester, or maybe you have some other health issues already, and you are unable to fast, then it's best you don't fast. If, if the danger is to the child, maybe you can't breastfeed. Yani when you have a child, and you're unable to breastfeed if you fast, in that case again, you are capable, you're able to not fast, because of the health of the child, but then you have to make up, and how, and things like that, will be in the details, you can either watch the rules or ask, Abu Abdullah. Tayyip. Now, I will again, for the sake of time, just mention briefly on some of the things that do break the fast and some of the things that don't break the fast, and then I'll open it up to question and answer. No doubt, intentional eating and drinking breaks the fast. Somebody intentionally eats and drinks in Ramadan, it's a sin, it's the first thing, and they have to make that day up. There you Cupping, when you get pajama done, from what is the correct opinion, even though there is khilaf of ulama on this issue, is that it does break the fast. Right? And you can look at our durus or look at Shaykh al Munti or Shaykh al Taymin to look at the evidences. Anything that is like cupping, meaning that if that large amount of blood is given, not a small amount, but large amounts cupping, it's a large amount, would also invalidate the fast. Tayyip, nutritional injections, shots that you get that are nutritional. You get a B12 shot, right? It, it gives you nu nutrients, would invalidate the fast. Um, marital relations, obviously, actual intercourse invalidates the fast. And what is like it, like the, what's called the secret habit, and I'm not going to get into detail there, but you should understand, those invalidate the fast. Yep. Regarding some of the things that do, say, before we go on, intentional vomiting, and you make yourself vomit, right, invalidates the fast. Unintentional vomiting does not. Yep. Smelling a perfume, liquid, or yeah, any evaporated perfume does not invalidate the fast unless it is like the bukhur and you smell it so much that you can taste it in your throat. Then it becomes like as if you are eating it because you're tasting it. Right? Putting kufr, putting the, uh, what do you call it? Not eyeliner, the kufr in the eyes, whether for men or women, does not invalidate the fast. The men's kohol is not done out of decoration, but for women, if they put eyeliner, for example, this is, uh, does not invalidate the fast. Tayyib, bleeding, small amounts, not like cupping. But if you give a sample of blood, small, any little thing that they usually take for blood samples, or your gums bleed, or you have a pimple that pops and bleeds, does not invalidate your fast. Using an inhaler for asthma does not invalidate the fast unless you use so much that you start to taste in your throat, which would be unusual. Usually, it's just gas. It's not something where you can taste. So that is not something that would invalidate the fast. Getting a tooth removed. Right? Now, going to the dentist, you have to be a little careful because nowadays dentists, they put water and things. And if that water goes down your throat, then that would invalidate your fast or any kind of shot that they give you. But in essence, as long as nothing goes past your throat, dental work does not invalidate your fast. Nose drops. People that put nose drops out of necessity, unless you put so much that you can taste it in the back of the throat, does not invalidate your fast. Okay. Um, now, we get to a few of the more modern problems, right? 
Vaping, cigarette smoke does invalidate your pass because the taste can be felt in the throat. So this is something. But if somebody else is smoking and you just smell it, it does not invalidate your past. Non-nutritional shots, injections, shots that you get that are not nutritional. Let's say you get a COVID shot or you get something like this that is not meant to nourish your body, unlike a B12 shot or so on. It does not invalidate your fast. Tayyip. Um, some of the more stranger questions I get, touching a dog does not invalidate your fast. I'm not sure that this is what I got recently, right? Um, touching a non-mahram woman is haram. Touching a non-mahram, but it does not invalidate your fast. Right? Um, a basic rule is anything, and this is, I'm giving you a very general rule, I'm not going to go into details in this does, that if you do invalidate your fast, what do you have to do? You have to make up one day. And make tawbah if it's sinful. Except if you have marital relations in the daytime of Ramadan, just don't do it. Because <laughs> then you have to fast two months straight without a break. Right? So that one you really want to be careful about. Um, other relations that do not, not actual yeah, any marital relations or something that would be uh, in a way that would take place of eating and drinking. Other than that, any if a spouse sit together, hold hands and things like this, that does not invalidate the fast. Okay. I think I'll stop here inshallah and open up for question and answer. Uh,